Well, we've been doing this series. This is the third week in this series on Jesus and my people. And uh, what we're doing is looking at how Jesus did relationships and uh, learning some principles from him. Um, this week we're doing uh, one on the new commandment. And it's from John 13, 34 to 35. So I want to begin with just reading that and then we'll talk about that for a while. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you and also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. This commandment Jesus repeated three times in the course of just a few minutes. It's there in John 13 and then again in chapter 15. And he gives this commandment while they're in the upper room, still in the midst of the Passover meal. Now, that doesn't mean a whole lot to us for to talk about the Jewish Passover, but to them this was a very emotional time. It had ties that went back in their, in their history a long way. So it's Jews, they had, they had eaten Passover meals in their families when the whole family would be together. And they would, re would remember mom's cooking. Oh boy, she could roast the leg of lamb. Wow, was, you know, what a cook she was in her matzo ball soup. Oh, <laughs> to die for, you know. So they had those memories that were there, being in their parents' house and being part of that family and what it meant to be in their family in their tribe, what it meant to be a Jew. So this would kind of be, the closest thing we have to this is Thanksgiving, you know? And uh, it's still on Thanksgiving, it's kind of strange because it's actually a secular holiday that we have a religious practice for. We're grateful on Thanksgiving, but it, but it comes from our, our secular roots and uh, everyone is there and nobody misses and, and you have some, some standard things. And so that's what the 12 disciples and Jesus are doing there in that upper room. And, and remember at the beginning of the meal, and I mentioned this last week at communion, at the, at the beginning of the meal, Jesus washes their feet because they're too uppity to wash each other's feet. They've been having a discussion over which one of them was the best disciple. And so nobody will do the the servant attitude of washing your guests feet actually should have been Peter but because he's the guy that's kind of in charge of the meal but he doesn't do it so Jesus takes off his outer robe and gets a towel and he washes their feet and then as they're eating the meal remember he picks up this unleavened bread and he gives it new meaning no more does it just mean that this is the bread unleavened it didn't have time to rise meaning we had to flee out of Egypt really quick when when Pharaoh was after us but he says this is now my body which is for you and do this in remembrance of me and then later on in the meal he takes up the cup and of wine and he gives the wine new significance and he says now this is my blood the blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and so while he's there, he also says that one of you is going to betray me. And they all go, it's not me, it's not me, it's not me, it's you, you, you know. And, and Peter says, hey, I'm ready to die with you. It's not me, because I'll die with you. You know, I'm, I'm all the way with you, Jesus. And, and Jesus says, ah, not quite so fast, Peter. You're going to deny me is what you're going to do. Then he gives them this new commandment, love one another. He gave the first commandment, love God with all that you are. The second commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. Then he gives this new commandment, love one another. So I guess the first thing for us to decide is who's one another? Who's, who's this aimed at? Who are we supposed to, lo to love? Is, is it another at love everyone or is it love someone? And, and since he gives his disciples this commandment three times, it's apparent, I think, that he means them, that they are to love each other, especially since he adds that, that uh, when, they, when they keep this commandment, that the whole world will know that they are his followers. So this commandment becomes kind of their uh, slogan, their logo, okay? This is their identity as followers of Jesus Christ, is we love each other, okay? That's what goes on the marquee outside of their first little church building. That's, that's funny. Uh, 
don't anybody think that they actually had a first little church building, all right? For, so since since nobody, <laughs> thanks. And so we hear this that that he's telling us to love each other, and we think, well, I can do that. I, you know, I like Christians. Christians, I am. Well, I like most Christians. I mean, I, I can love Christians. Uh, there are kind of a few that kind of get under my skin, but I can do this. And just when we think that we can do this one, then he says, he says, love them just as I've loved you. And we think, oh man, Jesus, you could have talked all day and not said that. I thought I could do this, you know. Jesus commands us to love one another as he's loved us. And when he spoke of love, he didn't say, well, now just do the best that you can. Make a valiant effort out of it. You know, do it better than other people. Try real hard. Give your best shot. No, he says, love one another like I've loved you. I go, wow. I mean, he might as well have said, Don, uh, what I want you to do is to dunk the ball with both hands on a 10-foot goal. Right? That's going to make about as much sense to me. He might as well have said, well, don't ever fear anything again. That's my commandment. Because we go, well, I just, that's just not going to happen. See, I think with this phrase that's added, uh, do this the way that I did this to you, we quickly add this into that box with all the other impossible things that he said to us. You know, we got that box. It's all the commands that sound so impossible to us, like love your enemies. We go, oh, gee, you know. Uh, don't be so anxious, he says. I go, I can't do that. That's impossible. Have faith to move mountains. We go, whoa. You know, it's just kind of like right over the top of the head. So we just put it in that box. You know, I think we hear some things from Jesus and we throw them in this box of impossible Jesus stuff. It's like he's the ultimate exaggerator guy. You know, like he's always exaggerating things a, a bunch. He's you know, Jesus hyperbola, you know, he's just like, he says, you're blessed or you're happy when everyone is saying bad things against you. You go through the whole, you know, Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 through 7. He says all kinds of these things that seem so exaggerated. If someone hits you, well, turn your head and let him hit you on the other cheek. You go, that's, that's not going to happen probably, Jesus, you know. He says, don't ever get even. Yeah, how about this? If you call your brother a fool, you're in danger of the fires of hell. Really? I can't ever call anybody a fool again? Ever? Or, okay, how about this? If you have a little lust in your head, it's just like you did adultery. You go, man, put it in the box. Put it over there with all that exaggerated stuff, you know, that he's saying. Does, does he intend us to live up to this? Is, is, I mean, is this law over here? And, and then, you know, what we assume, I think, is that, well, he didn't really mean that you, you ever get there. What he means is that you're just going to try hard. We're just going to really try hard to never have lust, and we're going to really try hard to never get angry and call anybody a name. And I mean, we're going to give it our best because what's going to make him happy is that we just do our best, even though we're going to fail at it, as long as we try hard, you know, we think that, well, that's what he means. Now, I want us to think about this at the very beginning here. Um, is, is that the God of the universe that we serve? Is this the God of the universe that is going to grade us on how hard we try? Give it your all, guys. Oh, you try. Oh, you didn't try. Oh, sorry. But now you really tried. You failed, but you really tried hard, so that's okay. Do you think he set standards for us, knowing that we're going to fail on all of these standards, that no one is ever going to reach them? But he sets those standards, so we'll just live a little bit better than what we would have had he not set that standard that high. Is that the God of the universe that we serve? Is this the God we serve? Kind of a try harder kind of God? You know, the ultimate motivator coach God? No. Christianity is not trying harder, Christianity is trusting Jesus. And I know there's a lot in that, what I just said, but Jesus, 
isn't grading us on whether we've tried or not. He's calling us to trust him, to, to live in him. He is, he is showing us his kingdom. This is what the kingdom looks like, guys. It's in Matthew 5 to 7. This is part of it here with love each other in the same way that I've loved you. That's the kingdom. It's, this is heaven on earth. When you live in that, you're in the kingdom. Now, so this is real. This, this is not exaggeration, what he's saying. And, and we, we do ourselves a great disservice if we, if we discount this and put it over here in this box. Don't throw Jesus in the exaggeration box. I mean, we can live in the kingdom now. If we don't believe that, then we're not believing what he said. And everything that he said had to do with the kingdom. Jesus is not exaggerating. He's showing us that what life can be like now when we live in him and he lives in us. Now, when, when preachers say what I just said, most of us go, shut that off. You know, I'm not sure what all that means, that he lives in us and I live in him. And if we don't get this, then, then really much of what Jesus said just doesn't make any sense. It really isn't. It's just a bunch of exaggerations, just a bunch of, you know, big stuff. His commandment to love one another, really senseless to us and impossible. Jesus goes on in John 14, and he, he says, in John 14, he says, I'm in the Father, and the Father is in me. John 14, 11. So he, what he says that what he does isn't all about him, but he actually is doing what he sees the Father. He is the Father to us. And they see a man, they see flesh and blood, and he goes, oh, not so fast. When you're looking at me, you're looking at the Father. Father is living in me. I am living in the Father. Heaven is things right now that I'm doing. Heaven is here on earth in me. And then he goes on to say, I'm going to the Father, and when I go to the Father, since I'm leaving this earth, I'm going to ask the Father, and he's going to give you the Holy Spirit is what he tells him. And what he means is that this connection that I have with heaven is now going to be with you. It's not going to be just me here on the earth. Your connection with heaven isn't just me in a physical sense, but now your connection with heaven will be that the Holy Spirit will come to you, and he says he's going to live in you. He's going to abide in you. And so you're going to have this permanent connection with heaven where there is no sin, where, you know, this perfect world where God can be in you. And then he says, I'm leaving and the Holy Spirit is coming to be in you and then you will know that I am in the Father. And he says, and you are in me and I am in you. Now, you can hear all this stuff and kind of talk, sounds like double speak. The point that he's getting to is that when he leaves, he says, that it's to our advantage because he's physically not here on the earth anymore, but his spirit, the Holy Spirit, will be in us and we can be in this place of doing all of what sounds like exaggerated things, of loving everyone when we are in him. And the reason that Jesus says these things that sound exaggerated and impossible is because they're possible when we are living in Him, when, when we are living in the Spirit. And that life begins when we say, I want to love the way that Jesus loved. And, you know, it's not only do I have the Holy Spirit, but now the Holy Spirit has me. And that's possible when we are there. I want to love, but I can't. But God can love in me as He lives in me. And, I mean, we can try all we want to do it, but until... We let God do it in us. It's just not going to happen. So the relationship principle that Jesus teaches us is that the healthy whole relationships are not a matter, matter, a matter of reading books, of watching YouTube, of going to conferences. That's not how we learn great relationships. But healthy, loving relationships come from the Holy Spirit living in us. Let's just jump to the end game. Instead of reading all the books, and the books aren't bad, but the ultimate reality here is that we are all only going to be able to treat other people 
with love to the degree that we are living in Christ, living in the Spirit. There's a, a couple of books in our library uh, two or three years ago. Uh, there was a group that used them uh, by Gary Thomas. Two great books, same spiritual truth. The first one was Sacred Marriage. The second one was Sacred Parenting. And Gary wrote those books. They, they, they both taught the same truth that our relationships with our spouse, our relationships with our children are intended to make us more holy than they are to make us happy. Now we think the, the secular teaching and some of the Christian teaching is that relationships are to make us happy. And Gary says, no, your relationships are to make you holy because as you have to extend grace in your relationships, you will have to seek God if you're going to do that and you're going to get closer to God and start living in his kingdom. So, so you know, God's power will allow me to lay down my life for my spouse by this one that I'm intended to love and to give her or him grace. And the secret to having peace with my children is to live in Christ, to be in his kingdom. Okay, so I, I have the power to release them to God for God to work in their lives instead of me using them in order to make myself happy. You understand the distinction there? Great books. If you haven't read them, I really suggest you pick one of them up someplace and give it a read. It's the power of love comes from God. Now, second, uh, the commandment to love is an action, not an emotion. Understanding the difference between action and emotion, between what we feel and what we do, empowers every relationship that we have. You know, over 80% of our decisions come from our emotions, how we feel. 80% of our brain, our emotional brain, is much, much larger than our, our logical brain. We have humans are very emotional, even guys. Guys, you're uh, emotional people. Uh, you just don't show it at the same times or let it out that everybody knows. And that's not bad, but it can short circuit, okay, our intentions to act in love sometimes. So Jesus comes along and he says, I command you to love in a new way. So how can he do that? How can Jesus command us to feel love because that's what we think love is people think love is a feeling well you can't you can't com command someone to have a feeling we you know you can't manip you can manipulate someone's emotions but you can't command an emotion it, it, it'd be just like me saying to someone well i insist at this moment that you be happy and it's not going to work very well i insist right now that you be content all right not going to work, is it? We can't command an emotion, but we can command an action. So when Jesus is saying love one another, he's not commanding us to feel love. He's commanding us to do love. It actually has nothing to do with emotion. He's commanding us to action. He's saying act in love, not feel loving. And we don't get that sometimes. He's saying act in love towards another person. There was a story uh, by Kent Hughes that, that told a story that I thought really hit this on the head. He, several years ago, he says, my wife took a, my wife, uh, several years ago, one of my wife's friends took a missionary furlough. I messed that up. His wife has a friend who was a missionary, okay? And they went, he wrote it wrong. I'm sorry. And, and they... <laughs> They went on furlough, which means they'd been in the mission field for a long time, so they took a break. And uh, she had been looking forward to this time with great anticipation, been living in another country, and really looking to get back stateside, take a furlough. And for the first time, she was going to have a place of her own, a new large townhouse-styled apartment with a patio. She was very creative, so she made the patio the focus of her decoration. And after a few months, some new neighbors moved in next door, and he said the word to describe that would be coarse. There was loud music day and night, along with a constant flow of obscenities. you got a Christian missionary living next door to these people. Uh, he says they urinated in the front yard in broad daylight. Well, that takes it to a new level there with just one sentence, doesn't it? 
They totally disrupted her peace. She could see nothing good in them. And so she asked the Lord to help her be more loving, but all she got back from her neighbors was just disgust and rejection. And the crisis came when she returned home to discover that her neighbor's children had sprayed orange paint all over her beautiful patio, the walls, the floors, everything. She was distraught. She was furious. She tried to pray but found herself crying out, I can't love them, Lord. I hate them. So knowing she had to deal with the sin in her heart, she began to converse with the Lord about her and her inner being. And the scripture came to mind. And it's from Colossians 3.14, where Paul says, And beyond all these things put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. So in her heart, she questioned, Lord, how do I put on love? And the only way she could picture it was like putting on a coat. So that is what she determined to do. She chose to wrap herself in the love of God. As a result, she began to experience a deeper life of Christ. She made a list of what she would do, and this is, I think is very important, if she really loved her neighbors, then she did what she had listed. She made a list of what she would do if she really loved them before she loved them. She baked cookies. She offered to babysit for free. She invited the mother over for coffee. And the most beautiful thing happened. She began to know and understand them. She began to see that they were living under tremendous pressure. She began to love her enemies. She did good to them. She lent to them without expecting anything back. And the day when they moved, she wept. An unnatural, unconventional love had captured her heart. A supernatural love the love of Jesus, love and action, and then the feeling followed the action. Well, we do things all the time that we don't feel like doing. Uh, we're able to get up in the morning, most of us, and go to work even when we don't feel like it. I guess, you know, when we say, do things even when you don't feel like it. Some might say, well, that would be inauthentic. You know, I, I, want, I don't want to be a hypocrite. So maybe what we should do is just when we don't feel like go to work, call up the boss and say, you know, I'm just not feeling it today. I just, you know, kind of think I'll stay home because I, I, I want to be real. And I, you know, I really don't want to be there today. The boss would solve that problem for us really quickly, wouldn't she or, or he? Feelings can mislead us. Do you think Jesus felt like dying on the cross? He said, I can't wait to get there. I just can't wait to get to the cross to suffer. No. He did. He says he, he literally sweat blood and anguish on the cross. He said, you know, if this cup can pass from me. He literally sweat blood. But then he prayed, not my will, but yours be done. So this is what we might call nevertheless love. Love that's not moved from our feelings, but love that's commanded and the feelings follow. To have the action of love, there are always going to be so many times when we find ourselves like Jesus. Going forward in love, we do not like or feel. And I think oftentimes that it's then when God is most powerful in our lives, when we love in action that we don't feel. There's going to be many times when nothing in, in us wants to love someone else. Your, your spouse may betray your trust again. Your children may do the same stupid thing again. Nevertheless, love. We, we might rant in private and rehearse how we're, we're going to tell our friend or our, our family member or somebody at church, we're going to tell them what we really think. But Nevertheless, love is the love of God in us. It's heaven here. It's kingdom now. See, the other way to look at this new commandment, to love as he loved, is to see that it is not impossible, but that Jesus is teaching them and Jesus is teaching us how to follow him so that they can lead others. He says, Love like I love. Love as I love. Do as I have done. He just finished washing their feet, is what he had done, because no one in the room would do it. So the leader, the Son of God, 
the king of kings does the least wash their feet and then he says now do the same thing that's good leadership isn't it see this this goes way beyond the commandment to love this is this is a principle that has truth in in every area of life this is about all of our relationships Jesus says the father told me and I told you now you tell someone else as I received I gave as you receive you give we can only lead in a relationship to the degree that we are a good follower S.I. McMillan in his book none of these diseases tells a story of a young woman who wanted to go to college but her heart sank when she read the question on the application blank that asks the simple question are you a leader being honest and conscientious she she checked no she was not a good leader and returned the application expecting to be rejected for the worst and to her surprise surprise she received a letter from the college dear applicant a study of the application forms reveal that this year our college will have 1452 new leaders we are accepting you because we feel it is imperative that we have at least one follower <laughs> we can only love to the degree that we receive love we can't do any more than that but let that sink in for a minute you can only lead to the degree that you are a follower we can only put love into action to the same degree that we are willing to be loved by someone else we, we can't lead unless we follow we can can't give unless we first receive now I know that sounds theoretical and something that you might put on your refrigerator or post on Facebook but it does come home to us every person has someone that they are in a position to lead to pour your life into every person has someone that that doesn't mean that we're smarter that we're wiser that we're older or we're holier or anything else it just God positions us in life that for at least for a season there's always one person that we're pouring our life into seasonal influence if you're a parent then it's your children there, there's no question about it you're leading your children every moment of every day if you're an older sibling and sometimes even a younger sibling then you are leading another sibling so brothers and sisters need to recognize that I am constantly influencing my younger brother my younger sister it's important for us to know the relationships where God has has put us positioned us for seasonal influence and to realize that we can only lead them, help them, influence them, the degree that we are good followers. There's a relationship, there's a relationship path that leads from the Father to the Son, to the Holy Spirit, to us, and to someone else. So, this morning, are we aware of the path? Are we aware of who we're following so that we can lead the one that God has put us with. I think that's what Jesus was trying to get to those disciples that day. That they would, by the way that they loved each other, influence the whole world. See, we know Jesus as the Messiah of love. Not because we have seen him or heard him, but because of the influence of the men that he led. He loved them, they loved others. And that became the earmark of the early church, was behold how they love one another. Important principle. So for us today, ask yourself the question, who are those people? Who are the people that I am following, that I'm following Jesus in them? And also the next question, who is it that I am leading? Who is it that I'm influencing? Who is looking to me to be the one? Every day it's an upper room. Every day Jesus is saying, I want to be with you. I want to be in you so you can influence this other person with me. Be a good follower and together we're going to love them. It 
all who are thirsty. Dip your heart in the streams of life. Let the pain and the sorrow be washed away in the waves of His mercy. As deep cries out. 